Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. By the way, be sure to join us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash UNC knowledge, facebook.com forward slash UNC knowledge. Uh, you can submit questions, make comments, suggest guests. A foreign correspondent and foreign policy analyst, Michael Totten, has reported from the Middle East, the Balkans, and the Caucasus, and writes regularly for Commentary Magazine and Pajamas Media. His new book, The Road to Fatima Gate. I pronounced that correctly, Michael? You did. All right. Excellent. Segment one, how come? Let me quote to you from The Road to Fatima Gate. Beirut in 2005 looked and felt like the beginning of a new Middle East. There seemed no better place to cover the region as a foreign correspondent. Beirut Spring, though, did not last. All right, let's spend a moment on those few sentences. You're not affiliated with the New York Times or the Times of London. It's my understanding that you substantially support yourself as a foreign correspondent. You have your own website. You write for commentary. Your work appears on Pajamas Media. Why are you, Michael, a foreign correspondent? It's the best job in the world. Simply because? Because I get paid to write, which I've wanted to do since I was a kid. Actually, my mother tells me I, that I wanted to be a writer before I even remember. Really? When I was four years old, that I would draw pictures and write stories underneath the pictures, and I don't have any memory of doing that. So, my entire life I've wanted to be a writer, and I love traveling. And uh, this is the perfect combination of these two. Okay, now why the Middle East? The Middle okay. East is where the action is. There's, a, there's always a story, always a story in the Middle East. Always has been, probably always will be. But it also becomes, I mean, it has become for me interesting on in its own terms. I've spent enough time now there now that even if the rest of the world stopped being interested in the Middle East, I would continue to be interested in the Middle East. So, <clears throat> sounds to me as though you're, you're old-fashioned in the sense that you like the sound of a little gunfire off in the distance. Not as That's, much as people think I do, actually. Really? No, there are, look, I, I have colleagues in the media who are real adrenaline junkies, and it, it's like any other drug. They have to get increasingly more and more brave in order to get their fix. And I can understand it and relate to it to a certain extent. And you know, Winston Churchill was right when he said, there's nothing so exhilarating as being shot at without result. But it's not the sort of thing that I want to repeat on a regular basis. So the attraction to the Middle East is what? with our mutual friend Christopher Hitchens. By the way, Christopher Hitchens gives you a wonderful blurb on the cover of the book. It is extremely rare, writes Hitchens, to read such an accurate account of anything to which one was oneself a witness. Um, so with Christopher Hitchens, Iraq is the big story because all his life, in one way or another, Christopher views himself as combating the bad guys, fascism. And he sees in the old regime of Saddam Hussein a fascist regime, thugs, and he wants to take them on. Your interest isn't quite that, is it? It's close, actually. Is it? I, do, I actually, I do share um, Christopher's hatred of totalitarian regimes. And I always have, ever since I learned about the Holocaust in seventh grade. Mm. I've had a visceral hatred and disgust for them. Why Lebanon? Lebanon in 2005, during the revolution against the Syrian military occupation of the country, looked and felt like an Arab version of Berlin in 1989. Mm. That's how it looked, that's how it felt, that's what a lot of us thought it was. As it turns out, it was more like Budapest in 1956. Mm. But at and the time, this was not clear. Things looked good, but it was about to get much worse. And your yes. prior history, so you moved back to Lebanon in... 05. 05. Yeah. And your prior history with the country, you'd been in and out to report. Had you, you had lived there or you had not lived there? Well, I had visited during, during the Cedar Revolution in 2005. I see. And I knew after about two weeks that I was going to really miss this place when I was gone and that I might want to come back for a longer stay. All right. Cedar Revolution of 2005. Um, Prime Minister Rafiq Hariri is assassinated. And soon afterwards, I'm quoting again from The Road to Fatima Gate, quote, about a million people in a country of just more than four million descended on Martyrs Square in Beirut and demanded the immediate termination of Syria's military occupation. The story captivated the world. Just go through the basics here. Why did the assassination of the prime minister lead to a quarter of the population turning out in the streets for demanding 
demanding something. What, what was going on? Explain that. Okay, let me first back up and talk about the demographics of the country for a second. All right. Le think of Lebanon basically as divided into threes. W roughly one third is Christian, mm -hmm. another third is Sunni Muslim, and another third is Shia Muslim. And the politics in the country are and have always been sectarian. So Rafi Kariri was the former Sunni prime minister, and he was going to run for the prime ministership again, and he was probably going to get it. And he was, the Syrians wanted him to be prime minister when they began their occupation in the early 90s because mm -hmm. he was he was competent with the country's economics. But he increased, grew increasingly disgruntled with the fact that he had to answer to Syria if he's the prime minister of the country. And, he, and the community that he led within the country, the Sunnis, Sunnis, were also increasingly disgruntled with the Syria's occupation. And the Christians had been disgruntled with Syrian they occupation were never from the in very the beginning. Place. They All were right. never gruntled. All right. The only group in the country that supported the Syrian occupation were the Shia Muslims, not all of them, probably two-thirds of them, because the Syrians supported Hezbollah, and Hezbollah is a Syrian militia. And so the Christians had always been against the Syrians, and as soon as the Syrians decided they were going to assassinate the leader of the Sunni community, both the Christians and the Sunnis came out against the Syrian occupation at the same time. So two-thirds of Lebanon was openly against Damascus for the first time since Damascus came to Beirut. Okay. Segment two, what makes Lebanon, Lebanon? You've just described the Cedar Revolution. Let's go, I'm a little leery of this because this happens so often in discussions of the Middle East. Let's go back a thousand years. A thousand years. Okay. <laughs> Not quite a thousand years, but again, let's, let's lay out what Americans need to know. By the way, I'm a perfect subject for this because my ignorance is approaching the total. What Americans need to know to comprehend in at least a basic way, Lebanon. Let me quote to you from The Road to Fatima Gate. There was the dirty little secret in Lebanon everyone understood perfectly and few Westerners wanted to think about. Politics were dangerously split along a fault line more than a thousand years old. Now you've just said that Lebanon was divided roughly in threes on sectarian lines. Elaborate a little bit. Okay, the thousand year old fault line. It's actually thir about 1300 years. Very shortly after the establishment of the Islamic religion, there was a power struggle. And what happened is the Shias, who we think of as the Shia Muslims, which are ten, about 10% 10 of the Muslims worldwide, supported the losers in the power struggle. And who are now the Sunnis supported the winners in the power struggle. And they have been divided ever since. So this is a group that's not good at letting bygones be bygones. Neither one of them are. Nobody in the Middle East, and it's not just the Sunnis and Shias. In the Middle East, everybody has long memories in this part of the world. Okay. So... Give us something. This is not like Protestants versus Catholics in, say, Kansas, where everybody gets along with everybody right. else. It's more Protestants versus Catholics in Ireland during the peak of the Troubles. Yes, that's they, exactly what it, it's like. The, the divide is cultural, religious. They, they hate each other or they're able to live with each other. Give us some way of grasping how, how serious the rift is. Sometimes they're able to live with each other, but they never really like each other. And the rift is... The, the communities are defined by religion, mm -hmm. but it's not necessarily a religious fight. You've got atheist Sunnis hating atheist Shias. I see. All right. In this part of the world, you have a religious identity whether or not you believe in God. Lebanon, what we now think of as Lebanon, a little smaller than the state of Connecticut. We're not talking about a big place, an intense place, but not a big place, is several provinces within the Ottoman Empire. Ottoman Empire collapses. Uh, Lebanon becomes a French mandate, achieves independence in 1943, French withdraw in 46, as I, if I'm recalling your chronology correctly, and then basically from the late 40s until the mid 70s, there's a country that works pretty well. What went right? What went right? Yes. What went, we will what get went to wrong. what, well, we'll yes. get to that, okay. but what whether you've got about three decades when this country works pretty well. Beirut is referred to as the Paris of the Middle East. Mm -hmm. The country as a whole is sometimes called the Switzerland of the Middle East. It functions, right? It did function. Okay, so, so what went right? Okay, here's what happened. So back then, the demographics were a little bit different. The Christians were actually a slight majority in the country. They were about 51%. Below 50, all right. Mm -hmm. about, I think it was about 51%. All right. Nobody's really sure because there hasn't been a census since the 30s. 
and everybody's afraid of what the numbers are going to say. Got it. So nobody, they all agree they don't want a census. But Christians were just barely more than 50% of the country. And they created a pact with the Muslims that they were going to have power sharing and that the, the central government was going to be weak because Christians did not want to be ruled by Muslims. Muslims did not want to be ruled by Christians. Sunnis did not want to be ruled by Shias and vice versa. So everybody had an interest in a weak state. So Lebanon became a sort of libertarian-ish country in the Middle East by design. It was the only way uh, that they would agree to live together within the same country. This actually, if you look at the history of the Middle East, those three decades of Lebanon represents a huge achievement. They actually figured out not necessarily how to like each other, but how to get along with each other. Mm -hmm. And it worked. It did. Lots of international trade, tourism, it was a safe country. Okay. Um, from 1975 until 1990, civil war, what went wrong? What went wrong was Yasser Arafat's Palestine Liberation Organization was in Jordan. This is like war and peace because yeah, every, it's, you, every, there's a, every time you start a chapter, a new character walks through mm -hmm. the door. All right, go ahead. Okay, so Arafat and his PLO are in Jordan and they launch a war against the Jordanian monarchy to try to take over the country. The Jordanian monarchy fights back ruthlessly and evicts the PLO. The PLO flees Jordan into Lebanon. So they're in the south of Lebanon along the Israeli border and they create a little state within the state down there. And uh, they use it as a base to launch terrorist attacks against Israel. They also created a little state within a state in West Beirut, which is the Sunni Muslim half of the city. And uh, the Christians weren't very happy about this. They didn't like the fact that they've got a, they've got a Palestinian state within a state in their own country that's uh, starting wars with Israel. So, and the, but the government wouldn't do anything to stop it because the Sunni Muslims of Lebanon welcomed the Palestinians. So the Christians organized militias to take care of the Palestinians themselves. So they had, been, by design, constructed a country with a weak central state, and mm -hmm. suddenly along came a problem that only a strong central state could deal with. That's right. If the state were to deal with it at all. Right. So the Christians decided to handle it privately. Yes, with, with their, their own, own militias. militias. Got it. And small clashes mushroomed. So Christians start opening apart. fire on Muslims, and from that point on, it's only a matter of time until the the until country the is thing engulfed. Came apart. Yeah, and then every every faction was fighting every other faction, and each faction subdivided into multiple factions that were okay. fighting each other. I mean, it was a, it could not possibly have been more of a mess than it was. Okay, last element I think to get the basics of Lebanon on the table. When does Syria come into the picture? Syria came in during the war. First, to keep the Palestinians, um, to, rescue, to save the Christians from the Palestinians, and then later to um, keep the Christians down. The Syrians didn't really care. Uh, they, they, switched alliance, they switched sides in Lebanon constantly. What is the Syrian interest in Lebanon? Why do they care ab at all? about? Why, why would they want Lebanon? They want Lebanon in this, for the same reason that Saddam Hussein wanted Kuwait. Some it's a small, of... weak neighbor. Uh, that's a source of income, basically. And there was also an, the, uh, an ideological element in both. The Saddam Hussein Kuwait, Saddam Hussein said Kuwait should have been part of Iraq, and the Syrian government said Lebanon really should never have been separated from Syria in the first place. Segment three, Hezbollah land. The road to Fatima Gate. Quote, Hezbollah learned to send journalists like me, Michael Totten, to men like Mohammed Afif, did I pronounce that correctly? Yes. To men like Mohammed Afif, more interesting than anything Afif actually said were his facial expressions. Let's get to Mohammed Afif in a moment. What is Hezbollah? Hezbo Hezbollah in Arabic is Hizb means party and Allah means God. So Hezbollah is the party of God. It is a radical Islamist political party, militia, and terrorist organization. And where does it fit into the sectarian matrix you just laid out for us? It's Shia. It is Shia. Yes. And where does it fit with regard to Syria or Iran or other foreign powers that keep monkeying around in Lebanon? It was created by the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps in 1982 in Lebanon's Bekaa Valley in the east along the Lebanese-Syrian border. And Syria also supports Hezbollah for practical reasons, because it's useful, but Iran sponsors Hezbollah for ideological reasons. 
It is basically the Lebanese branch of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. All right. And what does it do in Lebanon? Let me back. So who runs Lebanon now? Nobody. Okay. And what then is the importance of Hezbollah? How big are they? What territory do they hold? What do they do in Lebanon? So they hold territory along the Israeli border region and they rule it like an Iranian satellite state inside Lebanon. And they answer to Iran. And they also have the suburbs south of Beirut near the international airport. And they rule that the same way, like an Iranian satellite state. All right, now bring us to Mohammed Afif. Tell okay. us about your encounter with him. Okay, Mohammed Afif was the one interview that the Hezbollah press relations office would give me. They didn't tell me it was going to be my only interview, but it was my only interview. And this guy was very well practiced in the art of saying nothing remotely controversial. Nothing. Nothing even of interest, actually. He was so boring. So, Michael, you turn up and say, I'm a f you know this is a terrorist organization, mm -hmm. you know they report to Iran, and you treat them as if they're the Red Cross or the <laughs> League of Women's Voters just to see what would happen. You knock, 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 may I have an interview, and they give you Mohammed Afif. That's right. All right. Um, <laughs> so he, he gives you a series of bland interviews, or gives you a very bland interview, mm -hmm. and then something happens, and I'm going to quote again, the road to Fatima Gate. Here you are quoting a phone call that you suddenly get from Mohammed Afif. You insulted Hezbollah, he said. Who do you think we are? And then he said something I won't ever forget. We know who you are. We read everything you write. And we know where you live. What did you do to arouse the displeasure of this otherwise bland press secretary? I cracked a joke on my blog. That's it. Let's hear the joke. And it, it, wasn't, it wasn't, wasn't even it, funny. It wasn't the farmer's daughter. What was the... No. No, well, okay, so let me back up. So it makes it wasn't even really very funny. It's not a joke per se, um, but but I was kidding around. I had announced on my blog that I was going to go visit the Hezbollah press office, and I got twenty, thirty emails from Your blog. readers. Let's, let's do a little publicity here. What, okay. The blog is my name. It's MichaelTotten.com. dot com. T o t t e n. Two t's in the middle. dot com. Go ahead. Right. Okay. So I announced just a little just a little line on my blog that I was going to go down to the Hezbollah press office. And I got 20, 30 emails from people who read my blog who didn't know me personally, and I never even heard of these people before, saying, don't do it, you're crazy, they're going to kill you. And I thought this was a bit silly. I mean, Hezbollah has a press office, and every journalist in the country has gone down to this press office. I mean, they weren't using the press office as bait. It's not kidnapping bait. They weren't waiting with a, with a butcher knife to kill me when I showed up. So, uh, and I said so in the comment section of my blog, and yet I still had a bunch of people telling me that I was an idiot and that I was going to be lucky to get out of there alive. So when I actually did go down to the press office and I met the press secretary briefly and arranged the interview and I came back to my apartment in West Beirut and I just wanted people to know that I had been down to the press office and I was still alive. So what I wrote was that Hezbollah came and they picked me up and they blindfolded me and they stuck me in the back of the car and they drove me around in circles before they let me out. And this is basically what Hezbollah did use to do to American journalists who had arranged an interview. Did and you, did you put a, end it with one of those little emo, smiley face emoticons? I didn't, but you the didn't. next sentence, the first sentence in the next paragraph, I said, I said, actually, that's not what happened at all. I just took a taxi down to the press relations office. I mean, it wasn't, okay, so the initial let's... experience wasn't really even very different if, than if you were going to meet, like, the press secretary for the Republican Party or the Democratic Party in the United States. And I said this very clearly. Okay, so you established beyond doubt that Hezbollah cannot take a joke. Yes. All right, once again, the road to Fatima Gate. I thought I had an idea what Lebanon would feel like if these guys, Mohammed Afif and his uh, colleagues, ruled it. Lebanon in 2005 was a libertarian's paradise. Under Hezbollah, it would be a bigoted, authoritarian, gender-segregated, micromanaging, bully state. Close quote. Explain that. So before I was threatened by Hezbollah's press office, I was invited to an iftar, which is what, it's, it's the meal after sundown during the month of Ramadan when Muslims are supposed to fast when the sun is up. Right. So I was invited there with a photographer colleague of mine, and we went to this event, and it was gender segregated. Men had to sit on one side and women had to sit on the other side. And my colleague 
Well, let me back up for a second. We had to submit photocopies of our passports in order to get into this event. And to which you'd been invited. To which we'd been invited, All but right. we nevertheless had to submit photocopies of our passports. Right. Just the front page with our name and, right. and right. Uh, our photographs. So we submitted these. They let us in. And somebody in Hezbollah security went through these photocopies of our passports and found that my photographer colleague's middle name was Isaac. Which sounded Jewish to them. Yes. A name from the Old Testament. All right. So he and I were detained, screamed at, threatened, interrogated. Not me so much. I was told that I could leave at any time, but I stayed with him because I went there with him. He was actually my roommate. I wasn't going to leave my roommate when we were there together and, and grabbed at the same time. And he was interrogated. I mean, it was, it was an Inquisition-style interrogation. And it was because his middle name was Isaac. This was clear. They thought that he was Jewish and they suspected that he might be Israeli, just for this reason, for this reason alone. And he and I were both blacklisted for life because of this. This was before, before Hezbollah ever threatened me. Does Hezbollah want to run Lebanon? Yeah, they do. They know they can't. It's not realistic, and they know that they are not going to be able to rule over Christians or Sunni Muslims with an Iranian-style government. They would like to, but they know they're not able to do so. Still, their day-to-day -day operat operative impulse is to expand their power. Yes. Got it. Segment four, the view from Israel. One of the four principal goals listed in the Hezbollah Manifesto of 1985, quote, quote, Israel's final departure from Lebanon is a prelude to its final obliteration, close quote. Now, by now, a lot of people in the Middle East have learned, a lot of Muslims in the Middle East have learned to live with Israel. Egypt, by far the most populous Arab country, We'll see how the new, how it plays out in coming days, but for more than 30 years, Egypt kept the terms, roughly, of its peace treaty with Israel. Why not Hezbollah? Hezbollah is extremely ideological. The government of, the government of Egypt has not been ideological since Gamal Abdel Nasser died. 50, yeah, four, maybe, something like that? I don't, I don't remember, remember exactly the date, but it was in the 50s. A long time ago. Egypt has had a pragmatic, non-ideological military regime since then. And Egypt lost a number of wars with Israel. The Egyptian army lost the wars with Israel, and the Egyptian army has been running Egypt. And the Egyptian army wasn't really particularly interested in another go-around. So, well, we'll come back to this, but what you're saying is that Hezbollah... From this distance, one of the big questions for Americans when they look at the Middle East is what motivates these people? And broadly speaking, one large argument is all they want is normal lives. They want the trash collected. They want good jobs. They want a chance to build homes with running water and good hygiene and give their children a good education. And broadly speaking, the other school of thought is no, they don't. They really want something the reestablishment of a caliphate, some sort of 12th century style theocracy. What you're saying is that the second school of thought is correct, at least as it applies to Hezbollah. They don't want some sort of modern functioning democracy. They want, what do they want? They want an Islamist state and they want resistance. Resistance is like the core of their ideology. Resistance against Israel, against the United States, against the West, against Sunni Muslims, against Christians, you name it. Right. They hate basically everybody who's not themselves. Now, the Fatima Gate is a long closed border crossing between Lebanon and Israel. The road, in the road to Fatima Gate, you reach the Fatima Gate and you spend some time on both sides. You describe a conversation you had with an Israeli lieutenant. This is shortly before the Israeli Hezbollah War of 2006. Quote, every day I wave at Lebanese, pe Lebanese people, he said. Do they ever wave back? I said, uh, not usually, no. Do you know why, I asked? Because waving hello to an Israeli is treason. What does it cost Israel? What does it do to Israel to know that southern Lebanon is, at this state, I think you have to say, more or less permanently controlled by an organization dedicated to Israel's obliteration? What does that do to the... To, what, what, what defense burdens does it impose on the Israeli defense forces? What does it do to, to the Israel, Israeli public opinion? Israelis feel seriously under attack. They always have felt under attack since the nation state was founded. 
And Lebanon, I think, frightens them more than, any, any, than anyone else or anything else. Because here you've got, controlling the northern border, a organization that is a political party, a militia, a terrorist organization, and in some ways a conventional army. It's all of these things at the same time. And they have a missile arsenal that is bigger than what most national armies have. And Hezbollah has actually succeeded in fighting the Israelis to a standstill. Okay. No one else has ever been able to do that. This brings us 34 days in July and August of 2006, there's war between Israel and Hezbollah paramilitary units. Some 1,200 dead, mostly Lebanese. One million displaced Lebanese moved north from the southern tier of the country. Perhaps 300,000 displaced Israelis. Two quotations from the road to Fatima Gate. One, most Israelis were convinced, this is you in your own words, most Israelis were convinced that they had either lost or that the conclusion in the war was at best a draw. Almost everyone in the world seemed to believe that. That's quotation one. Here's quotation two. And here you're talking with Michael Oren, who was at the time a spokesman for the Israeli Defense Forces and is now the Israeli ambassador to Washington. Quote, quoting Michael Oren, Hezbollah's command and control south of Beirut is completely gone. We killed 550 Hezbollah fighters south of the Latani River out of an active force of 1,250. Hezbollah claimed South Lebanon would be the graveyard of the IDF, Israeli Defense Forces, but we lost only one-tenth of one percent of our soldiers. Most Israelis believe that something went terribly wrong in that war. Michael Oren says, look at the statistics. It was a military victory for us. What's going on? Well, Oren is right. It was, if, if you compare Israel and Hezbollah with the same criteria. Israel clearly won the war because Hezbollah took many, many times, orders of magnitude, more casualties. And South Lebanon absorbed far more physical destruction to buildings and infrastructure than northern Israel did. But the two countries, or I shouldn't say, Hezbollah is not a country. The two sides. Two forces, two sides, for sure. The two sides are not judged with the same criteria. Hezbollah says that it won the war because it's still standing, which actually is, like I had said earlier, the only Arab fighting force that has ever fought Israel to a standstill. So it does look like, from its point of view, like it has won a war with Israel. Why did Israel accept the standstill? Why didn't the IDF go into southern Lebanon and clean it out? I don't think it's possible, actually. As a military matter, you can't get to them because they're operating in a civilian uh, population? Yes, and they're a guerrilla army. They're a terrorist army. They're also a guerrilla army. Israel, if Israel wants to clean out South Lebanon, it's going to have to fight a counterinsurgency. We know how hard counterinsurgencies are. We've been fighting the Taliban in Afghanistan for how long now? Ten, Ten years. years. Ten and we're not years. done. And we might not ever be done. Israel fought Hezbollah in South Lebanon from 1982 to 2000 and failed to get rid of Hezbollah for 18 years. So why the Israeli government thought that it could get rid of Hezbollah in one month after failing to get rid of Hezbollah in 18 years is quite honestly beyond me. Segment five, the solution. I should try to indicate a question mark in, <laughs> in my intonation there. In the road to Fatima Gate, you re this is near the end of the book, maybe about three-fifths or four-fifths of the way through the book, you recount a discussion you had with Walid Jumblat. Am I pronouncing that correctly? You are, yes, that's right. correct. Walid Jumblat, who's the leader of the Druze minority. This is a, about a, uh, to simplify things, you left this out when you were talking about the sectarian divide, but the Druze right. are about a quarter of a million or so in a population yes. of four million. Right. Um, so what do you think the solution is, I asked. I'm quoting the book. The solution is not in Lebanon, he said. The solution is in Tehran. Is he correct? Yes. Yes, he is correct. Because Hezbollah is controlled by Iran. It is the Mediterranean branch of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. It's like an overseas brigade of the, Ira of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps in Lebanon. Uh, the Obama administration is eager to draw down our troops in Iraq. They want out and is refusing to put boots on the ground in Libya. They don't want in. Walid Jumblat, once again, quoted by you in The Road to Fatima Gate, Making the Americans totally withdraw from the Arab world would be a mistake, would be a disaster for the moderates in the Arab world. The radicals and the Iranians would win." Close quote. 
explain what he means by that and then tell us what you, whether you agree with the reasoning. I do basically agree with his reasoning. His reasoning is that the United States, and the, okay, first of all, he said this, let's see, which year was it he said this? This must have been 2000. Oh, I don't have the date written down here. Seven? I'm that not sounds, sure. This, this I don't certainly remember after exactly. the war. It's, it's yeah, so it, was, right. it was during, it was during when we were still fighting a hot war in Iraq. So maybe it was 2006. It was either 06 or 07. The United States military was the only force fighting Iranian power in the Middle East at the time. No one else, no, there, there, there's no one else willing to do it. So if it wasn't us, it was going to be nobody. That, that was his point. That was his point. Yes. Is that strictly speaking true? There is the other argument, there is the argument that if the United States had just stayed out sooner or later, the Saudis, possibly the Egyptians, the Egyptians have population, the Saudis have immense wealth, they certainly can buy any military equipment, they have a lot of military equipment, sooner or later they would have felt it, they would have taken it into their own hands and done what they needed to do. We should have stayed out of it, it's not our region, it's a violent, difficult, just the way you, you took uh, several minutes just to begin to explain the basics, the basics in Lebanon, and, it's a very, and that's the way politics are throughout the Middle East. There's no way we can master them. Leave it to the people in the Middle East. What do you make of that argument? Well, I have some sympathy for the argument. I mean, the Middle East is a mess. It's gonna be a mess no matter what we do. If uh, anyone asks me what, what I think the solution is, well, I will have to say that there isn't one. I mean, I've asked myself, uh, I've, asked, question. <laughs> I've asked Middle Easterners over and over again in Arab countries and in Israel, so what's the solution? Nobody has, nobody proposes a solution. Nobody even believes there's a solution. The very question is American. Nobody in the Middle East thinks there's a solution. But we do have interest in the Middle East whether we like it or not. I mean, what, what happens in the Middle East, Middle Eastern politics affects the United States. Okay. We learned this on September 11th. Also, um, if the Iranian government dominates the Persian Gulf the way it wants to, then it's going to be able to set whatever price for oil that it wants to. And because the Iranian government is implacably hostile to the United States and the West, they could do significant damage to us, very significant damage to us, okay. ec economically. You are constructing, I think, an argument that leads, I think, inevitably to a certain conclusion, but let me push it a little bit. If the solution lies in Tehran, question, can the, Isra can the Israelis handle Tehran on their own? I don't know. You don't know? I don't know. I don't know if they know. I've asked Israeli military and government and intelligence officials if they are able to stop Iran's nuclear weapons program and if they are willing to stop Iran's nuclear weapons program. And I get different answers from different people. And I don't know who's right. So if there is even a serious doubt that the Israelis can handle it on their own, then we must. Isn't that the conclusion? I would agree. Some people wouldn't because they don't want to, they don't want to go there. And I understand very well why they don't want to go there. Okay. Um, listen, the Arab Spring, of this year took place after you'd completed the writing for The Road to Fatima Gate. Let me ask you about that very quickly. So Tunisia, then Egypt, you get popular uprisings that overthrow strongman governments. In Libya, where rebels, as we tape this, are still struggling to topple Gaddafi. All this was in some ways reminiscent of the Cedar Revolution in Lebanon in 2005. As you argue, in The Road to Fatima Gate, the Cedar Revolution came to nothing, essentially, correct? Yes. All right. So what do you expect to happen in Egypt? I don't expect a good outcome for Egypt. I don't know Egypt nearly as well as I know Lebanon. I've only spent a, a week there. I'm by no means an expert in Egypt, but I, I had an apartment in Beirut when I went to Cairo, and I had a terrible feeling in the pit of my stomach when I went from Beirut to Cairo, that whatever happens in Egypt is not going to end well. And I spoke to some Egyptian liberals, I say liberal in the g generic sense of the word, who were a lot like Lebanon Cedar revolutionaries, the same kinds of people with the same sorts of political views but they told me that they were only maybe five to 10% of the country. And, and what it, Lebanon would demonstrate is even if you're 25% of the country, all these good, uh, idealistic, good human beings mm -hmm. march in the streets, a relatively small but dedicated and brutal core of Islamists can trump 
even a huge proportion of the country. Is that yes? That's absolutely correct. So, so you'd expect the Muslim Brotherhood or some other some permutation of Islamism to win out eventually in Egypt. Is that right? Yeah, I could be wrong, but yes, that's that's the, that's that's the feeling that I had while I was there, and I have not yet been argued out of it. Three final questions, and we're running out of time, so I'll give you a sentence or two on each. How's okay, that? Sure. Any Republicans making sense to you in talking about the Middle East, particularly presidential contenders? I'm not paying the slightest bit of attention to what any of them are saying. I, so I'm thank you sorry, for an honest I do answer. not I know. Thank you for an honest answer. The Obama <laughs> administration strikes you as naive, duly realistic. Where would they be on that spectrum? I would put them on the naive end of the, of the spectrum. All right, last question. Five years from now, things is, I have the feeling that things move quickly in the Middle East. The, yeah. the road to Fatima Gate suggests that. Five years from now, will Lebanon have moved further toward becoming, in your words, a bigoted bully state? That is to say, will Hezbollah and Iran have more power over Lebanon? Or will it somehow have found its way back in the direction of that libertarian's paradise of 2005? I think Lebanon is doomed until there's new governments in Syria and Iran. That there's no way that Lebanon's going to get out of this on its own. Michael Totten, journalist and author of The Road to Fatima Gate, and the author, I should also add, of MichaelTotten.com. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. For Uncommon Knowledge, I'm Peter Robinson. Thanks for joining us.